This is toddler Carl Fisher from Hartlepool. This video was taken when he was a baby, around one year of age. And this photograph was taken a year later, when he was two. Look at Kyle's right eye. There is something immediately and obviously wrong. Kyle's eye is at the heart of a tragic case, which may prove to be yet another miscarriage of justice. Roughly three months after this photograph was taken, Kyle was dead. The toddler's head was allegedly smashed against a banister with a force akin to being thrown from a car crash at 60 miles an hour. And this is the woman who was convicted of murdering Kyle in July 2004, babysitter Suzanne Holdsworth. She's serving life. I spoke to Suzanne when she rang home from prison. Did you kill Kyle? No. Um... Would you have ever harmed him? No. Never. Susanna Holdsworth denied ever harming the toddler, but she was damned by the blinding clarity of the scientific evidence against her and was sentenced to life. You might say, lock her up and throw away the key. But what if the science was wrong? Do you think, having examined Carl's brain, that this conviction is safe? No, I don't. Suzanne's family have never believed that she was a murderer. I know Susanna. I've known Susanna 18 years of my life. She's no murderer. Do you think your mother murdered Kyle? No. Why not? She's not our person to do that. She'd never let anyone. These people also have doubts about the conviction against Suzanne Holdsworth. Kyle's granny, aunt and his dad, John Taylor, now separated from Kyle's mum, Claire Fisher. And it just happened to be that she was babysitting them. And I, I could have been babysitting them, so that means that I probably would have ended up in jail. Hard-faced, Suzanne Holdsworth was painted by the prosecution as a violent woman who'd threatened friends and relatives verbally and physically. It all went towards creating the image of a woman who could smash Carl's head in. But it wasn't the person friends of Suzanne Holdsworth recognised. She wouldn't do it to him. She had no reason. She was in the wrong place at the wrong time. She looked after him that night, and it could have been me looking after that night or anyone else. He died that night, but it wasn't Sue that done it to him. A banister very like this one is critical to the Crown's case. The lethal head injuries were caused, it was claimed, by Suzanne repeatedly ramming Kyle's head against a banister at her home. The prosecution alleged that Suzanne used violent force, equivalent to a baseball bat or being clubbed by a bottle, or being thrown from a car crash at 60 miles an hour. Now, in this small space, it seems very difficult to imagine how that possibly could have happened. Wayne Squire is one of the country's preeminent neuropathologists. She has studied Kyle's brain for Suzanne's new defence team. When the jury heard that um, Kyle suffered a, a shocking force equivalent to a 60 mile an hour car crash, being thrown from a car crash, the jury heard an incontrovertible truth? No, they heard meaningless uh, emotive words that have absolutely no scientific validity. A 60 mile an hour impact of a baby's head on a banister would cause massive damage to the head, massive skull fracturing. Kyle had bruises, he had no scalp swelling, he had no skull fracture, so I think that is extremely unlikely. The prosecution's time frame appeared to nail Suzanne. It was almost conviction by stopwatch. The lethal impact happened in a 75-minute time period when Suzanne alone was looking after Kyle. But any impact is hard to square with what the forensic scientist Neil Garton found on the suspect banister. No visible hair or tissue, and he made no report of finding blood or a dent. The murder left no trace on the blunt object, a case of the unmarked banister. Garton didn't rule out the banister, but said... I am unable to comment on the extent of such contact or how it may have occurred. Conclusions Judge Grigson said were of such breathtaking banality that it's difficult to see why he should be bothered. There was bruising to Kyle's head, but what day that happened isn't clear. The forensic evidence for violent impact that night seems remarkably thin, but the Crown's time frame cannot be questioned. 
or can it? It has to be Suzanne Holdsworth because Kyle was fine beforehand and then 75 minutes later, in Suzanne Holdsworth's care, he was mortally ill, going on to die. So she did it. You can't be certain. You simply can't be sure. And we now have a lot more evidence about what happens in babies, which is different. Babies tend to respond with much more brain swelling and less tearing of the fibres of the brain. Now, if you tear fibres in the brain, you're likely to show evidence of it immediately. Concussion. It happens at once. But if the brain is swelling, it takes time to do this. And this is completely individual. Everybody's brain is likely to swell at a different rate, depending partly on age, partly on the cause of the swelling. And so it's impossible to be absolutely certain that the injury was inflicted in that one and a quarter hour period. Indeed, Kyle could have appeared healthy for days after he'd suffered a slow to develop, but potentially lethal brain injury. We call this a lucid interval between the event that causes brain damage and the brain damage manifesting itself. So what appeared to be one of the most horrific murders in Hartlepool's history is now very much open to doubt. There are big questions about whether a 60 mile an hour impact in a 75 minute time frame ever happened. And that may mean that Suzanne Holdsworth is innocent of murder because no such crime may have taken place. But that's not all. Cleveland police were so proud of their inquiry into Kyle's murder that they produced a two-page colour spread in the Force magazine. It boasts of a relentless investigation. Or was it? At one year old, Kyle was a normal-looking baby. At two, he wasn't. His eye were drooping down, so it's like one eye is like open fully and the other one were just really closed. And his hair? His hair, like, not much hair at all. Do you think that it was obvious that there might be something wrong with Kyle's head, Kyle's brain? Mm, yeah. How old are you? 13. When Susan holds her phone 999, she put it like this. Operator, he doesn't have any other medical history, any heart problems or anything. Holdsworth, he's got a hole in his head, a hole in his eye, and they're going to take his skin off to get to it. In 2003, a year before he died, Kyle suffered a dreadful injury which left him with a hole in his right eye socket. In addition, he also had an undiagnosed rare brain abnormality. So Kyle wasn't a normal healthy child at all. At post-mortem it was clear that there had been a fracture to the roof of the eye socket and that the brain had started to push down through that fracture, pushing into the eye socket and displacing the eye. I looked at this area very carefully under the microscope and it looked to me as if this was an old fracture rather than a congenital malformation, but he'd had a fracture to that eye socket. The brain had pushed into it and the significance for me as a brain pathologist is that the brain itself in that area was scarred. How did that injury to his eye happen? I don't know, I wasn't there. But, uh, did you do it? Pardon? Did you do that? No, no, I wasn't even there. At trial, the jury was told that the eye injury had occurred in the spring of 2003 when Claire Fisher, Kyle's mum, was looking after him. He'd fallen out of his buggy. I were arriving back from work and Claire came out of her back garden and she were cradling Kyle. This was small at that time, cradling Kyle. And his eye socket was full of blood. The jury did not hear any evidence that brain tissue was pushing through the hole in the eye socket and pressing against the back of the eye. It appeared not to have any relevance to his death. But what effect might it have had on Kyle? Patients who have epilepsy have scars in their brain and they act as a focus for the epileptic activity. So Kyle, in fact, had two abnormalities in his brain that would predispose him to having seizures. And seizures can kill. And seizures can kill. And a seizure, or in layman's English, a fit, is exactly what Suzanne Holdsworth described when she dialed 999. Holdsworth, can I have an ambulance straight away, please? I'm babysitting for a two-year-old child, and he's just gone all floppy. Operator, listen, listen, calm down. Holdsworth, he's not breathing, his eyes are rolling and everything. Operator, has he had a fit? Holdsworth, yeah. 
Kyle was seen by face surgeon Professor Brian Avery two months before he died. He was very concerned about the boy's eye. Professor Avery first heard of Suzanne's conviction for Kyle's murder last year. He told Newsnight... I had potentially useful information and I was surprised that the police did not contact me. Following his death, the medical problem of Carl's eye should have been thoroughly investigated. If the information available to me had been available to the pathologists at the time, it is likely that they would have looked at some of the medical evidence in a different light. Cleveland Police's version is that they did contact Professor Avery's colleague, neurosurgeon Sid Marks. He allegedly told them over the phone that the eye socket injury was not relevant to the murder inquiry. Mr Marks told Newsnight that he couldn't recall any such conversation with the policeman. In the context of a murder inquiry, I would expect to be interviewed in person by a police officer and then asked to sign a statement. That did not happen, nor do I recall any conversation with a police officer concerning this case. One detective constable who worked on the inquiry for a time had concerns about the I-2 and that led to the entire murder trial being stopped for two days. But then the case continued and Suzanne Holdsworth was convicted. The officer has since left the police. For Suzanne's family, supporting a convicted child killer isn't easy. If I thought she could be anything like this, my children wouldn't be near her. But if I thought she could snap as she's been told she can, then what's to stop her snapping in front of her own children? It doesn't look as though Suzanne Holdsworth has led an easy life, but a killer? The babysitter's narrative that Kyle suffered from a massive fit has never changed. Now we know that he was prone to seizures all along. Do you think the police investigation into, the, into Kyle's death was proper? No, no. Far from it. It was rushed, it was pushed. We was bullied, get it into court, get it, get it dealt with, get it done with. And now we've got to wait another two years after the, after the original trial, three years, to go back to court to have the new evidence heard again. You're inside prison, you're a, um, you've been found guilty of uh, child murder. How, um, how have you been treated? Are the other prisoners? When I first came in, I got abuse. Um, what, what kind of abuse? I got called a nonce, a child killer, you know, um, and in a way I can't fault them because if I was in here and somebody that had come in and killed a child then I'd be exactly the same. But the difference is between me and the people that don't kill children is I'm innocent, I've nothing wrong. Christmas, um... What are you going to do? Do you want an honest answer? Yeah. Cry all day. <laughs> I go on the phone. I get up in the morning. I've done it twice before. Same routine every year. I get up in the morning, come on the phone, and I pretend I'm fine because my babies are having Christmas and my partner. So I pretend I'm fine. Yes, I'm all right. I go back to my room. And I cry, and I cry, and I cry. For speaking to the BBC to plead her innocence, the prison authorities have disciplined Suzanne Holdsworth. Her phone calls are now restricted. We put a number of questions to Cleveland Police, but they have declined to comment. There is no date set for her appeal.